<clears throat> the Great Race to Yorktown, Chapter 9, in King George, What Was His Problem? The year 1781 started out badly for George Washington. In early spring, a British warship sailed up to the Potomac River in Virginia and docked at Mount Vernon, Washington's beloved home and plantation. Lund Washington, who was running the plantation while his cousin George was away at war, hurried down to the dock to see what was going on. Refreshments for the enemy. When Lund Washington got down to the river, he saw that 17 slaves had already seized the chance to escape from Mount Vernon by hopping onto the British ship. Then Lund heard the British sailors calling out for service. Bring us food and drink, they demanded, or we'll burn the plantation. Lund did as he was told. When Washington heard the news, he didn't seem too upset that the slaves had run away, but he was horribly ashamed that his own farm had provided supplies to the invading enemy. As he told Lund, that which gives me most concern is that you should go on board with the enemy's vessels and furnish them with refreshments. It would have been a less painful circumstance to me to have heard that in consequence of your non-compliance with their request, they had burnt my house and laid the plantation in ruins. Another wasted year? And speaking of Washington's troubles, here was the biggest one. It was looking like 1781 was going to be another wasted year, yet another year without a major attack on the British. At this time, Washington and his army were camped just north of New York City. So was a French army of about 4,000 men, under the command of general known to his friends as the Count de Rochambeau. Washington had been hoping that this year, finally, the Americans and French would launch a series series attack on the British in New York City. So Washington and Rochambeau spent most of July looking through telescopes studying the British forts in New York City. They were hoping to find a weak spot to attack. There didn't seem to be a weak spot though. Washington was used to disappointments, but this one really got him down. How could he ever win this war? He was having a hard enough time just holding his army together. That's when it happened. Washington suddenly saw a way to win the American Revolution, and he could do it right now. He just has to raise his army 450 miles south to a place called Yorktown, Virginia. Why the race to Yorktown? That question really needs a nine-part answer. Part 1. The King Tries the South The first thing we have to do is take a look at, the king, at things from King George's point of view. Mighty Great Britain had been fighting these pesky Americans since 1775, and all that they had to show for it was control of New York City. The war was costing Britain a fortune, so much that the government had to raise taxes. King George was feeling the heat. More and more people in Britain were sick of war. They wanted to bring the army home and forget the whole thing. But you know George. He was still absolutely committed to victory over the Americans. So starting in 1779, the king decided to try a new strategy. The British army would destroy the revolution by capturing the southern states. The famously stubborn King George honestly believed that most people in the south were still loyal to him. Part 2. Bad Peaches. Bad General. At first, it looked like Britain's southern strategy was actually going to work. The British quickly captured big chunks of Georgia and South Carolina. Then Congress put Horatio Gates, the Saratoga hero, in charge of the American army in the south. Gates showed up in camp in July 1780 and saw that his soldiers were starving and exhausted. So what did he decide to do? He ordered them to march right toward the British. Hungry enough to eat anything, the men spotted unripe green peaches growing along the road. They feasted and quickly paid the price. The meal had painful effects, said Colonel Otho Williams. That was a polite way of putting it. Let's just say the peaches didn't stay in those hungry bellies for very long. Gates pushed his way, his weakened horses on, and on August 16th, they ran into the British general Charles Cornwallis and his army at Camden, South Carolina. While Cornwallis was crushing the Americans, General Gates panicked and fled from the battlefield, leaving his entire army behind. He was next seen 180 miles away. Was there ever an instance of a general running away as Gates has done from his whole army? wondered Alexander Hamilton, Washington's young assistant. So far so good, thought King George. Part 3. British Behaving Badly If only the king knew how badly some of his soldiers were behaving in the, Fran in south. in the south. One morning in 1780, a frightened girl came running up to Eliza Wilkinson's South Carolina home. Oh, the king's people are coming, shouted the girl. It must be them, for they are all in red. 
Moments later, Eliza saw a group of British soldiers riding up to her house. Where were these women rebels? They cried, waving swords and pistols. The soldiers jumped off their horses, ran into the house, and started stealing stuff. Jewelry, clothes, pretty much anything that wasn't nailed down. Then one of the soldiers saw the silver buckles on Eliza's shoes. I want them buckles, said he, and immediately knelt at my feet to take them out. Which, while he was busy about a brother villain, whose enormous mouth extended from ear to ear, bawled out, Shares there! I say shares! So they divided my buckles between them. A few minutes later, it was all over. Eliza watched the British soldiers ride off, their shirts bulging with loot. This kind of thing happened a lot, and you can imagine the British bandits were not exactly winning new friends for King George in the South. In fact, more and more Southern patriots began rising up against the invaders. Part 4. The Swamp Fox. That brings us to a South Carolina patriot named Francis. Marion. Marion started leading small bands of militia members on quick surprise strikes against British soldiers. Marion would march through the night, attack sleepy British soldiers at dawn, then disappear into the forests and swamps using paths and hiding places the British could never find. Marion never encamped over two nights in one place, said Tarleton Brown, one of Marion's men. The British hated Marion, but they couldn't help respecting his creative and daring style. They even gave him a nickname, the Swamp Fox. Even Continental Army soldiers hardly ever got a look, good look at the Swamp Fox. When Colonel Otho Williams met Marion and his Swamp Team, he was surprised to see a bunch of hungry-looking men in rags. Their number did not exceed 20 men and boys, said Williams, some white, some black, and all mounted on horses, but most of them miserably equipped. Miserably equipped, but very effective. With folks like the Swamp Fox around, the British Army was never able to gain control of the South. Part 5. Fight, lose, fight again. General Nathaniel Green took command of the American Army in the South at the end of 1780, and like the Swamp Fox, Green knew how to use geography to his advantage. His strategy was simple. We fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. Doesn't exactly sound like a formula for success, does it? Actually, it was brilliant. Green knew his small army wasn't strong enough to actually beat the British, so instead he decided to lead the enemy on a long and tiring chase all over the vast spaces of North and South Carolina. Once in a while he'd turn and fight a small battle, and he didn't mind losing these fights because he knew he was wearing the British down. Don't get the idea that Green's army was having a great time, though. Facing the usual Continental Army food shortages, the soldiers ate frogs, alligators, or anything else they could catch and cook. And with all the marching and camping, the men wore completely through their clothing by summer's end. At the Battle of Utah Springs, said General Green, hundreds of my men were naked as they were born. Well, at least it was warm. Part 6. Cornwallis Gets Tired over in the British camp, Green's strategy was having its intended effects. At first, General Charles Cornwallis was determined to catch up to Green. He ordered his men to toss away all their extra supplies, tents, clothings, even barrels of rum. He hoped this would let his army march faster, and it did, though the soldiers were very angry about the wasted rum. But Green always managed to stay a step ahead of Cornwallis, and by the summer of 1781, Cornwallis was frustrated, angry, and exhausted. He reported with a third of my army sick and wounded, the remainder without shoes, and worn down with fatigue, I thought it was time to look for some place of rest. So Cornwallis decided to push his army north. Maybe he hoped the British would have better luck in Virginia. Part 7. Spying on Cornwallis. Soon after the British entered Virginia, a 21-year-old named James Armistead decided to help kick them up. But first, he had to get permission from his owner, Armistead was held as a slave on a farm near Williamsburg. The owner agreed, and Armistead marched to the American camp. Armistead met with a young French general, the Marquise de Lafayette, only 23 himself. Lafayette explained that what the army really needed was more information about the location and movements of Cornwallis' army. Would Armistead be willing to take a massive risk to get that information? A few days later, Armistead walked into General Cornwallis' camp and told British soldiers he was an escaped slave looking to earn some cash. The British put him to work. This young guy proved to be very useful to the British. His detailed knowledge of the local geography helped the soldiers find their way around. All the while, James Armistead was sending reports back to Lafayette in the American camp. Then Armistead took an even bigger risk. 
He gained the trust of General Cornwallis and took the job of Cornwallis's personal waiter. This was the perfect position for a spy. Serving food and rocking around the dinner table, Armistead was able to see and hear everything that went on in Cornwallis's own tent. Armistead always had a hard time getting a close look at official maps and plans because Cornwallis was so careful with his papers. As Lafayette explained, his lordship Cornwallis is so shy of his papers that my honest friend says he cannot get at them. Armistead kept looking, though, and he kept feeding badly needed information to Lafayette. This helped the Americans keep a close watch on Cornwallis as he marched his army around Virginia. But exactly where, where was Cornwallis headed? Part 8. Pick a port. Any port. The truth is, even Cornwallis didn't know. All summer long, he exchanged angry letters with General Henry Clinton, the British commander in New York City. Like most top British generals in the war, these two guys couldn't stand each other. Clinton wanted Cornwallis to come north to New York because he was sure Washington was about to attack him there. Cornwallis wanted Clinton to come south to Virginia because he was convinced the British would capture this important state. They finally agreed on a compromise. Cornwallis would take control of a port town on the Virginia coast. That way, British ships could move soldiers quickly back and forth between New York and Virginia. So Cornwallis started looking for a good port. He picked a tiny town near the Chesapeake Bay. Welcome to Yorktown, General Cornwallis. Part 9. The French Sail North. Now there's just one last piece of the Yorktown puzzle. As Cornwallis was settling in at Yorktown, a fleet of French warships started sailing north from the Caribbean Sea. The commander of the fleet, Count de Grasse, thought he might be able to help with the war. His destination? The Chesapeake Bay. Now back to Washington. Now at last we're ready to return to George Washington. Last we saw him, his face was bright with excitement. And this is why. Down in Yorktown, Cornwallis and his entire army were in a trap, and the best part was they didn't know it. It was just a question of timing. If Washington could quickly march his army south to Virginia, he could surround Yorktown by land, and if the French warships took control of the Chesapeake Bay, they could surround Yorktown by water. Of course, all this had to happen before Cornwallis realized the deadly danger of his position. We had not a moment to lose, Washington said. The race was on. The trap slams shut. Our destination has been for some time a matter of perplexing doubt and uncertainty, wrote Dr. James Thatcher as he marched south with the Washington army. The soldiers actually placed bets on where they were headed. This confusion was just what Washington wanted. He needed the British to believe he was moving his soldiers into position to attack New York City. He even had his engineers build huge bread ovens around New York City to help trick General Clinton into believing the Americans were planning to stay for the year. Meanwhile, Washington continued racing his army toward Virginia. As far as he knew, Cornwallis was still at Yorktown. But where was the French fleet? He could get no update from the French naval commander, Count de Grasse. I am distressed beyond expression to know what has become of the Count de Grasse, he said, but there was no communication with ships at sea. On September 5th, just south of Philadelphia, a messenger brought Washington a stack of letters. He opened them and started reading. At, that, at this very moment, General Rochambeau's boat was rowing up to the American camp. Rochambeau looked toward the shore and, a wit and witnessed a very strange sight. I caught sight of General Washington waving his hat at me with gestures of the greatest joy. As Rochambeau stepped off the boat, Washington ran up to the Frenchman, hugged him, and told him the news. Twenty-eight French warships had just arrived in the Chesapeake Bay and were now surrounding Yorktown by water. Washington rushed his army onto Yorktown and slammed the trap shut on Cornwallis. We have got him handsomely in a putting bag, announced the American General George Whedon. <clears throat> Huzzah for the Americans. More than 7,000 British and German soldiers suddenly found themselves surrounded at Yorktown. Cornwallis begged Clinton to send help immediately. If you cannot relieve me very soon, he wrote, you must be prepared to hear the worst. But with French ships controlling the Chesapeake Bay, British ships couldn't get anywhere near Yorktown. At least Cornwallis still had his trusted waiter, jo James Armistead. And in this desperate situation, Cornwallis asked Armistead for a favor. He asked Armistead to go spy on the Americans. Armistead gladly took the job. He snuck over to the American camp and reported to General Lafayette. Now, as one of the country's first double agents, Armistead was able to move easily back and forth between British and American camps. He gave Lafayette key intelligence and fed Cornwallis information that was useless or just plain wrong.
Meanwhile, Washington tightened the rope around Cornwallis's neck by inching his soldiers closer and closer to Yorktown. It's fitting that Joseph Plum Martin, after six long years in the army, was here at Yorktown for the final battle. On March 8, Martin was, and the rest of the army proudly watched the raising of an American flag, the signal to begin blasting cannonballs into Yorktown, Martin reported. About noon, the much-wished-for signal went up. I confessed I felt a secret pride swell my heart when I saw the star-spangled banner waving majestically. Huzzah for the Americans, shouted the French soldiers. Then about a hundred American and French cannons opened fire. The French cannonballs smashed right into the buildings in Yorktown. Many of the American cannonballs plopped into the river or landed in empty fields. The French had a lot more practice at this stuff. The British shot back with everything they had, and the fire-tailed cannonballs crossed others in the air. Washington stood out in the open, watching the bombs explode in Yorktown. An officer named David Cobb urged the commander to be more careful. Cobb, sir, you are too much exposed here. Had you not better a step a little back? Washington, Colonel Cobb, if you are afraid, you have liberty to step back. Washington had worked seven long years for this moment. He wasn't going to miss it for anything. A shell, a shell. Over the next few weeks, the Americans continued moving closer to Yorktown. The men dug trenches and dirt walls to protect themselves from British cannons. For the American soldiers, the biggest danger came from British shells, or bombs, that land in the dirt, sit still for a few seconds, and then explode, sending scraps of metal flying in all directions. As a precaution, Washington ordered his men to yell, A shell, a shell, whenever they spotted one of these bombs flying into camp. This led to a heated debate between General Henry Knox and Alexander Hamilton. Knox thought the order made sense. Washington was looking out for the lives of his men, but Hamilton was eager to prove his manhood. He claimed it was unsoldierlike, kind of wimpy, in other words, to cry shell every time a bomb landed nearby. As the two men argued back and forth, two shells screamed down from the sky and smacked the ground near his feet. A shell, a shell, shouted soldiers. Knox, Hamilton, and everyone else dove for cover. But Hamilton didn't feel quite safe enough behind the dirt wall. He crawled behind the much larger Knox. Knox was about six foot three, two hundred and eighty pounds, and held on to Knox's thick chest for dear life. After the shells had exploded harmlessly, Knox stood up, straightened out his uniform, looked down at his young friend, and said, Now what do you think, Mr. Hamilton, about crying shell? But let me tell you not to make a breastwork of me again. The White Handkerchief Nothing nearly this funny was happening in Cornwallis's camp. We get terrible provisions now, said one miserable British soldier to Yorktown. Putrid meat and wormy biscuits that have spoiled on the ship. Many of the men have taken sick here. In early October, Washington started to see dead horses floating in the York River outside the British camp. The meaning was clear. The British didn't even have enough food to feed their animals. Sensing that victory was near, the Americans and French kept bombing Yorktown day and night. Then on the morning of October 17th, a teenage British drummer came out of Yorktown beating his drum. The Americans couldn't hear the drum over the sound of exploding cannons, but behind the drummer boy, they saw a British officer waving a white handkerchief. Cornwallis was ready to surrender. The world turned upside down. The official surrender took place on the afternoon of October 19th, 1781. Altogether, 7,247 British and German soldiers marched out of Yorktown and threw down their guns. They really threw them down. They were trying to break them so the Americans wouldn't be able to use them. The British officers in general behaved like boys who had been whipped at school, remembered one New Jersey soldier. Some bit their lips, some pouted, others cried. A British marching band played a tune called The World Turned Upside Down, and Upside Down is exactly how Charles Cornwallis felt on October 19th. In fact, he was so upset by his defeat that he sent a message to Washington saying he was too sick to come to, to the surrender ceremony. When Cornwallis finally did meet the Americans a few days later, he was in for one final shock. There in the American camp, proudly wearing his American uniform, was Cornwallis's trusted waiter, James Armistead. It is all over. Washington wrote a quick note to Congress telling them, the big news. I have the honor to inform Congress, he began, that a reduction of the British Army under the control of Lord Cornwallis is most happily effected. The news spread quickly, sparking celebrations from Georgia to New Hampshire. The reaction was quite different in London. When the Yorktown news arrived in late November, it struck Lord Frederick North like a bullet to the chest. Remember this is the guy who had once so boldly declared, America must fear you before she can love you.
Now he started pacing up and down the room, waving his arms wildly and shouting, Oh God, it is all over. King George didn't agree. I have no doubt he wrote that when men are a little recovered from the shock felt by bad news, they will find, they will then find the necessity of carrying on the war. When it became obvious to the king that he was the only person on the planet who felt this way, he got so depressed that he actually tried to give up his crown. He wrote a letter to Parliament saying, His Majesty, therefore, with such much sorrow, finds he can be of no further utility to his native country, which drives him to the painful step of quitting it forever. George's friends talked him out of this rash decision, <clears throat> and the king finally accepted the fact that the United States had won its independence. Peace talks began. Ben Franklin and John Adams, still driving each other crazy, represented the Americans. One last story. The peace talks took two years, and during this time there were a few more small battles in the United States. And it was at this time that one of the American Revolution's most famous soldiers joined the army under the name of Robert Shirtliff. What made Robert famous? Robert's real name was Deborah Sampson. Sampson grew up as, a, as an apprentice on a Massachusetts farm, plowing fields, chopping wood, stacking hay. She was tall and strong and eager for adventure. In the spring of 1782, she tied her hair back, put on men's clothes, and enlisted in the Continental Army. She was given a uniform, a musket, ammunition, and a knapsack. No one knew she was a woman. In a small battle that year, Samson was cut on the head by a sword then shot in the thigh. Covered with blood, she was carried to a hospital where a doctor bandaged her head wound, but Samson didn't want the doctor to inspect her too carefully. Even now, she was thinking about keeping her secret. So she grabbed a knife and a bandage and limped out of the hospital. Out in the woods, she sat on a fallen log and calmly cut the musket ball out of her own leg. I found that the ball had penetrated my thigh about two inches and the wound was still moderately bleeding. At the third attempt, I extracted the ball. She bandaged the wound and hurried back to the army. Soon after, she came down with a terrible fever and was back in the hospital. Too weak to eat, drink, or even move, she lay flat on her bed for days. In fact, other soldiers were pretty sure she was dead. They started arguing over who would get her clothes and boots. She had just enough strength left to signal for the doctor. He bent over to inspect the patient, and this is where Samson's secret was discovered. But the doctor told no one, and when Samson recovered, she once again returned to the army. This is goodbye. The American Revolution officially ended on September 3, 1783, with the signing of the peace treaty in Paris. Now everyone, even King George, had to admit the United States of America was a free and independent country. All over the country, American soldiers started heading home. Deborah Sampson took off her army uniform, put on women's clothes, and walked through camp. No one recognized her. Joseph Plum Martin, now 23, had dreamed of this day for years. But now that it was here, he wasn't quite sure how to feel. I can assure the reader that there, that there was as much sorrow as joy, he wrote. He had lived together as a family of brothers for several years. George Washington and his officers felt the same mixed emotions when they got together one last time at Fonce's Tavern in New York City. The general lifted his drink in the air and said, With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devotedly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. Then he asked each of his companions to come up and shake his hand. Henry Knox, who was his nearest, stepped up to Washington and took him by the hand. The room was silent. Every man in the place was trying desperately to keep his emotions under control. But it was no use. General Knox was the first to crack. Knox burst into tears and grabbed Washington in a big bear hug. Then all the other officers, tears streaming down their cheeks, lined up to hug their commander. Such a scene of sorrow and weeping I had never before witnessed, said Benjamin Tal Talmadge. Later that afternoon, Washington dried his eyes, left the tavern, walked down to the street to the wharf, and stepped onto a waiting boat. He turned and waved his hat to his friends as his boat was rowed away from shore. Washington stopped by Annapolis, Maryland, where Congress was now meeting, to officially resign as commander of the Continental Army. Having now finished the work assigned me, he told the members of Congress, I retire from the great theater of action. Then he traveled home to Virginia to enjoy a peaceful retirement with Martha at Mount Vernon. That's what he thought anyway. <laughs>